I'm going to now hand it over to Nana and to Gay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So thank you, Julie, for introducing us. And thank you, Gay, so much for doing this. I know that um, Blonde does um, this talk series um, regularly, and they always feature someone who is inspiring and motivating. And um, this week, it's you. So um, I'm really um, thrilled to meet you and connect with you here. And um, frankly, we all need some motivation. We all need some cowgirl power. So I'm excited to, um, to, to, to chat with you. How are you doing today? I'm just great. Um, very happily sequestered at our ranch in Texas. So um, I, I wish I could be in New York. I usually spend a lot of time there. But uh, for the time being, I'm uh, happily at our ranch and getting a lot of work done. Very cool. Very cool. I know that productivity um, has been something that um, some people have struggled with in, in the quarantine. We have suddenly all this time, um, but then um, it's hard to focus. So how do you, um, how are you sort of feeling that you're getting so productive or staying so productive in the midst of this? Well, if, at first I didn't feel like I was very productive uh, because I wasn't out and about and doing my speaking engagements and meeting people and going places and doing conferences and all the things that I had always done. So I had to think, how am I going to redo this? How am I going to rethink my life? Um, so one good thing is that uh, as an artist, and that's one of my passions, uh, it gave me more time to paint. And I've always done my painting at our ranch because if you can see behind me, I paint skyscapes and, and landscapes from life. I'm a planner painter and I go out and see what's in the skies and I, that's what I love to paint. So it gave me more time to really focus on my painting and I've gotten a lot done. So that's been a good thing, uh, and I've sold quite a few paintings uh, over the summer, which has been quite remarkable, actually. Uh, and the other thing is that I really started doubling down on what I was going to do after T3, because as was mentioned, um, I was the CEO and founder of that advertising agency, and I sold it in the fall. And so life after that, after almost 31 years behind the scenes and at the helm of T3, uh, I had to rethink. So we've been working a lot on some leadership training and uh, where we're going to go next with, with some of the potential speaking engagements, but mainly uh, they're virtual at this point. So that's what I'm doing <laughs> and working in the, at our ranch. It's a working ranch. So we bale hay uh, and we have a big hay business and dogs. And so I've spent a lot of time with training my dogs, their border collies and hanging out with the longhorn cattle. So lots to do. Very cool. Very cool. I saw one of the, um, the hail baying, um, the, the, the hay baying, bailing pictures on your Instagram account. And I was like, Oh, how cool. Um, but one of the things that um, I really wanted to um, chat with you about is reinvention. Um, when we, you know, when we spoke a little bit um, before this, and um, as Julie mentioned, like you've reinvented yourself many times um, in your business, and you're in the process of reinventing yourself now. And I think so many of us are doing that. You know, again, we have all this time on our hands, and so I wanted to know um, from you, how do you? Um, how do you approach reinvention? Uh, yeah, let's start there. Well, you know, when it happens, right before it, I always feel this anxiousness that I'm not really comfortable or doing enough in the role that I'm doing or, or a door closes or something. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, in 1997, and I started my company in 1989. And when you start a company, for anyone out there who knows an entrepreneur or if you've done it yourself, you wear a lot of hats and you do almost every job because you don't have the money or the resources or, you know, the people to come and take those positions sometimes. So there came a point in 97 and I remember it very clearly that I had almost worked myself out of every job at T3 <laughs> and I called myself I had fired myself from every job because I found other people who could really do those functions better than I could and I sat down and realized that my real strength and what I could offer the company was to put a growth engine under it. And that meant new business and existing client growth. So I took off and I went 
everywhere I could to meet people and to try to expose our teams to some top marketers around the country so that we could get uh, new business and bring in more money to grow the company. And that's what I did. And so again, right before then, I was feeling a little out of place because I thought, wow, I'm not useful anymore in this job or in this role. But when I found my real power, basically, in that new business role, that's what I, I stuck to that throughout my tenure at T3 because I knew how to bring in new business. And uh, that's the lifeblood, you know, of any agency or any program. So that was good. And also I always managed the finance team because I have a real passion around anyone who doesn't manage their money well and know their numbers is probably not going to do very well in business. So uh, I did that. The other thing is, as, as kind of as time went on, I never really built T3 to sell. And so you make different decisions along the way if it's not really always going to be on the market. But then one day our family decided maybe it was time to do that. And so we went through the process and I didn't have to sell and sell the company. I wasn't in desperation, but the right opportunity came along and we did that. So prior to that, I had already started to remove myself a little bit from some of my roles at T3 again and let other people kind of step up into those and promoted some other people. And that's when I went on my book tour uh, and really was all over the place and gone out of the office talking about my book and speaking to groups. And also with my art, I really doubled down on that. I was so fortunate to land a one woman show in New York at a gallery in Chelsea. And then one thing led to another after that. So those were two pivot points for me as I could see myself uh, evolving out of the day-to-day. -day. And T3 is and was a very, very technology-driven marketing digital firm. And uh, sometimes the AI and the different lines of code that they had to write were over my head. And so I felt like I need to let them do that and uh, I will go out and come up with some things that I'm passionate about. So that's, that's what I've done. Well, you know, when you were speaking, I heard like a couple things that kind of kept jumping out was one, this idea of um, identifying your strengths, um, which and then but which when you said that I, it made me think, um, but also it means um, accepting or admitting you have a weakness in, in a certain area. And I feel like um, when it comes to like the work environment or business, um, we always hear the opposite of that. Um, don't show your weakness, you know, you know, don't let anyone smell blood in the water. Um, so I'm wondering like how you, how you came to that like eureka moment, like where you accepted like, okay, I, I'm not good in this area. Um, and, but at the same time, I'm really strong in this area and how you kind of, I don't know, found, found um, that to be the strength, like accepting your weakness in a certain area. Well, I was very fortunate because early in my career, I was working for a management consulting firm and it was four guys who'd gotten their MBAs at Harvard. And one of the things that they were adamant about when we did training or we did consulting was giving the participants the Myers-Briggs type indicator uh, or the DISC test. So I was took that, uh, like I said, early in my career when I was working with them and it was very clear to me you know, what my strengths and weaknesses were based on that. And there it was right in front of me. And so I started to play into my strengths and I really started to do the things that I thought were natural for me because what we find is that we all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. People beat themselves up over their weaknesses their entire life if you let yourself. And you'll say, oh, if I could only be better at that or if I could step up that. And if you're not a detailed person and you're forcing yourself into detailed work, it is miserable over the long haul. And so I have this little simple diagram sometimes I say where you have your strengths here and you've got a situation. And what you want is for those two circles to eclipse because the more you're in your strength zone, in a situation you're in, the better you're going to be both mentally, your performance and everything. And so it's okay. And then the fun thing is when you find those people, uh, diverse thinkers or people who can, you can bring on your team, uh, then let them shine at the things they do well. And I always really try to figure out and understand 
every person on my team strengths and weaknesses so that I could put them in good situations for, for them. But it's a, something that self-awareness is so important and you just lean in, just jump into those strengths and absolutely just forget the weaknesses or the failures that you have because you know, it's okay. And there are other people who can do those things better than you and just admit it and be on with it and play into your strengths. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I can think of a lot of times when, you know, you just kind of like exhale and say, you know what, I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the liberation that comes with that. And um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, um, I appreciate that. And the other thing that stood out to me is that when you were talking about just like how you stay productive during this time and um, sort of how you, um, were able to kind of make that um, sort of transition, um, you know, after you sold T3 was you have this other gift, um, which is your beautiful um, paintings. Um, and, you know, you were able to say, you know, okay, well, um, now I'm going to focus on this. Or when you, you know, when you wrote your book and, and you were saying like, okay, now that um, the business is in, in a certain place, now I can go off and, you know, do my book tour and focus on that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and how um just how where how reinvention sort of dovetails with um accessing the other things that you can do because i feel like sometimes we get stuck in a certain path um and it's partly because we feel like that's the only thing that's viable um so i wanted to hear a little bit more about about that you know this those two things were actually something that i was good at as a young person, you know, I, I was a pretty good artist growing up. And so I ended up majoring in art in college. And I look back on that and that was almost a luxury now to think that I could spend time doing something I was passionate about not having to be a business student or something to go out and get a job. But fortunately I did get a job out of college, but, um, but I loved art and it was something that was always there. But you have to imagine, you know, that once I got in the business world and I have three children, all of the demands and stresses of business and life and family pushed art away. And I did not have time. It takes time. You know, it is a time consuming passion. Uh, and if you're going to be good at all, you have to put the work in. I always say, if you're going to be good at something, you know, you got to practice, practice, work, 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 because that's what it takes to get to a better place uh, and to excel in that, whatever it is. So I uh, had that BFA in studio art back burner. I was always a good writer. In high school, I won awards in the state of Texas for what we called ready writing. And that was where they would give you a topic at a competition and you had to write on it within a couple hours. And then you were graded against all the other participants. And I won awards and trophies for that. So I knew I was good at writing and I knew I was good at art way back, but I had not really practiced those skills in a long time, like I said. So writing the book was like re, kindling inside me a passion that I had. And so when I wrote it, I wrote it in my language. It is not written by a ghostwriter, which a lot of business books are, to be honest. Yeah, it's in my terms, my words, and it's the way I say things. And it's just plain English. <laughs> it's very authentic. Uh, and it's based on my experiences in life and advice that I've give because I've been through a lot of it. So, so the fun thing was these reinventions for those two things were actually passions of mine that started at childhood. So I advise people, anyone listening, that if there's something that you were always kind of good at when you were growing up, or you loved, or you admired, then maybe you go back to that. Uh, it's never too late. And say, well, if I was good at that when I was 20, then maybe that's something that I should be thinking about today and giving myself that opportunity to re-explore in a new way. Because what happens to us, and, and I remember when I was in art school, is that our professors would tell us that this is seen through young eyes. You know, you're 18, you're 19 years old, and what you're producing is, is fresh and it's through young eyes. If you continue with your art through your life, you'll be seeing things from a different lens or a different perspective. And that's what I'm seeing in my work. And it's even changed a bit during the pandemic because I started painting some that were a little darker. Most of my paintings are bright sunsets and sunrises. And it wasn't because 
I was trying to be morose, but it was just something about when I would see the clouds in the sky and I would try to find a silver lining, so to speak, and I did. Um, it was something that I wanted to paint. And so a lot of my paintings during this time are uh, a little darker, uh, more moons, more nights. And uh, I think it's just the mood of the time, you know, <laughs> that's reflected there. Yeah. Let me ask you one more um, in the in the line of reinvention. What is your advice to anyone who is feeling terrified of starting over? Maybe, you know, they, they know that they have this gift or this passion that they've had to stow away for whatever reason, or they're feeling like, you know, this is the time to like do it, but they're terrified or they're, they feel too old or too broke or just, or frankly, just stretch too thin. Um, to, 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 to pivot in another direction. Um, do you, do you have any advice for any, for any of that? Well, actually I, I do have this insight and that is when you do pivot and you do something that you have not really proven that you're good at or that the world will accept it, it is very scary. And I'll tell you how scary it is. Um, you know, I thought I was pretty good in college in art and I made good grades, but I never proven myself as an artist, a working artist who anyone would buy anything. Uh, and so when I started to expose myself in a way and get out there and, and ask people, what do you think of it? You know, and I met a woman in New York who was actually a, a deals in very fine art and I had the nerve. I mean, it was really scary. I have to tell you, here I'm a successful businesswoman. I walk in this gallery and I'll, I'll meet this woman and I decide that I'm going to say, would you look at my art? Would you ever look at some of my paintings? And she said, she was not like delighted. <laughs> she said, yeah, I'll look if you send stuff. Well, I kept sending her things and she started encouraging me and then eventually came to our ranch and looked at all my body of work and said, this is a direction you should go. So she was like a coach and a mentor to me. And how wonderful that as we go through different changes in our lives and we try to tackle new things that we find new people, new contacts that can start to advise and help us. And she actually was the one that recommended me for the show in New York. So we have ended up with a very wonderful friendship because of that, but it was scary. And the next part of that, that was even scarier was we hung the show in the gallery in New York. Now, I had no idea if we would sell one painting or two or five. I had no idea. You don't know. Once you're out there and you, and I say, put yourself out there, you're exposed and, and it's either going to win or lose. And I didn't know. So very scared. Uh, but we were just absolutely fortunate and opening night, we sold, I think 12 paintings and the time the show was over we'd sell 22 paintings it was wow. incredible it broke the gallery records wow. and uh, I think what it is um, you know is that my work hits a chord with a lot of people because it is those sunsets those sunrises those clouds that they're aspirational you know that we all love to see in the sky and we all share that it's a commonality worldwide that we all look up at the stars and the moon and the skies and and it's just something that's very uh, natural to us all so so that's that. Then the book thing was the same deal. I mean, and anytime I pitched a piece of business, it was scary, you know, for T3 or we were in that because you had the chance to lose every time you walk in the arena, in the arena yeah. and you have to just say, okay, if I don't win, um, if no one buys my book, which fortunately a lot of people have, um, or if no one picks us to do this or I don't win that award, then you have to say, okay, there's a reason why and what can I do to learn from it and how can I get better at that? Or maybe I'm chasing windmills, so to speak, the old Don Quixote thing. Um, and I don't need to be pursuing that because that's really not what uh, I'm good at or what we can do well. So you have to kind of break off from it sometimes, but always try to learn from a failure because it's there. The teachings are there. Uh, and those, those are the times that you really get better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hearing um, a lot about just how you are using things that you've learned in different sort of arenas um, to sort of help you or power you through into, you know, into doing something else that you're not so um, comfortable with or familiar with. Um, so that's, that's definitely a good, um, a good tip. Well, one thing I want to add to the audience is that you don't have to take a massive leap 
to start. Get your toe in the water, start to experiment, start talking to people uh, or trying to introduce or, or some way to people who are doing something similar. And then all of a sudden you learn from them and your comfort zone will grow as you begin to move in that direction. And there are certain times in our lives we have to make quick actions and make a decision because that opportunity is going to just fly by and if you don't do it right then it's, it's gone but most of the time we can take little steps to get someplace and you know when i started painting again i hadn't painted in years and so one day i just got the whim that maybe i should do it and i started one step at a time by going to the art store buying some canvas buying paint buying my brushes and, uh, and an easel and I set it up outside at the ranch and just started painting and I went through a lot of experimentation to get to a place that I thought was in a groove again for me. So that was a step. It was one step. And I want to say one thing real quick because this is very important. Um, there's a concept in my book and I talk about it calling timeline your life. And this is something that I would suggest all of us do again right now, if you've already done it once. It's something that's an ongoing living document where you really write down and put on a little timeline what you would like to have happen over the next six months, year, two years, five years out possibly. And you write down. Um, and if you will do that, you will be surprised how many of your goals and dreams will become a reality because what happens is if I say, for example, that I want to become fluent in Spanish. Now, what is it going to take for me to get there? I'm going to have to start being with people who are fluent in Spanish and having conversations. I'm going to have to maybe take classes. I'm going to have to read. I'm going to have to do all the things it takes for me to get there. And so if you don't write it down, you won't do the little steps, you know, that it yeah. takes to get you to the big goal. Yeah. So it's a very important thing to do. And this is a perfect time to do it because we all have a different um, set of time on our hands. It's just different. We're just in a different place now to be reflective. Yeah. And one of the, one thing that I would add to, because I, I, I think it's so true that like just quite, just putting down on paper, like the things you want to achieve is so powerful. Um, is also just leaving room for the wonder. It's like you take a step towards what you want to do and then like all these other things almost sort of align or help you kind of yes. um, find the path. Um, I've had in my experience um, and I was, I got, um, I was thinking about that when you went to New York and you, you know, you, you took the risk of approaching, um, you know, that, that gallerist. And then it's like, you ended up developing the kind of relationship that helped you get to where you needed to be so that you could be in a position to um, show your work and then ultimately sell, you know, break that record um, for the gallery. So that's amazing. Um, but I wanted to, um, speaking of your book, um, you talk a lot about, um, you know, also finding, um, you know, mining inspiration from the kick-ass women around us um, and the ones who've come before us, um, like the cowgirls in your book. Um, so I wanted to um, just kind of speak with you a little bit about like just that moment when you connected with, you know, the cowgirl. I, there, there was a part um, in, in the beginning of your book where you just, you write so reverently about like sort of walking into this museum and seeing, you know, the cowgirls, you know, the pictures of them and the images. What, what did that mean to you, like as a little girl? And what does that mean to you um, now? Like what? Uh, well, I grew up in a small town in East Texas, and I was fortunate enough to have a godfather who had a lot of horses, and he taught me to ride, you know, and I was in working cattle with him at, from four years old on. So I'd always grown around up around horses and people who had a wonderful relationship with horses. And that's a really important thing. There's a there's a great thing between usually a young girl and a horse if you have that opportunity. Um, but I watched women and I use the word cowgirl kind of metaphorically sometimes because it's that spirit it's that can do it's that honesty it's the grit it's so many of the qualities that I see in strong people men and women that I admire uh, and so in the book cowgirl power I wanted to spotlight a few of these women who had lived so many years ago and they're kind of like in the movie hidden figures where are the story about the women at nasa where here were these very strong 
capable women but if they hadn't told the story, we, we wouldn't have known about them. And so I did the same thing with the cowgirls. I mean, they were competing and winning against men up until the 1930s in very fierce competitions. I mean, like bull riding and, you know, roping and shooting and doing all these things in these rodeos and Wild West shows. Uh, and they were very successful. Uh, and I mean, tough and show people and you name it. Um, made their own costumes, traveled around, helped each other out. Uh, and I love the qualities of these women. Um, unfortunately, in the 1930s, the men decided that they would not compete with the women anymore because they claimed that the, too many women were getting hurt in the sport. Uh, but that's not really the reason. I, mean, I, I just felt like it was, <laughs> yeah, women were winning a lot. And so I think they just decided to part ways. And so that kind of ended that, that competition and that, type of you know line of work if you will and uh, I wanted to really when I went in the cowgirl museum it just it just came home to me about these wonderful people I'd grown up with and the 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 true values that they taught me and so I love putting them in the book because I don't want people to forget them uh, you know I like for people to get to know some of these women that were truly um, stars they were actually you know, the very first international female superstars in the world because not only did they perform in the United States they were invited by kings and queens and went to Europe and uh, Annie Oakley who's probably one of the most celebrated sharpshooters ever in the world uh, has photographs in the Calgary Museum of her just covered in medals you know from all all over the world and uh, just really really a uh, testament to saying wow if you really practice at something you can get to be good if that's a natural skill for you and she learned to shoot not because she was privileged and <laughs> you know and was grew up around a family that would uh, teach her that she did it to survive uh, when she was a kid like six years old her family didn't have enough food on the table and her dad had gone away and so she literally started teaching herself to hunt and she got so good at it that she sold the meat in the markets when they had enough and at one point by the time she was 15 she paid off the family farm wow. as an entrepreneur wow. who had taken her skill set and used it to monetize it so she's just a wonderful example and they all are but just you can see those stories and how they would inspire all of us yeah i one of the things that um struck me is um you talk a lot about um and you write a lot about collaboration teamwork and 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 getting that inspiration um, not only from the things that you can do but from other people whether they exist now or you you, you tap into the to their stories um, the stories of people who come before us um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the leadership um, webinars that you have um, uh, and basically they they act as like as a resource of inspiration right for for the people that attend I just wanted to hear a little bit more about about what, what the genesis of it was. I mean, you spoke about it a little earlier, but just kind of delve in a little bit more. Okay, well, thank you for asking. Um, well, as I mentioned that I had done and still was planning to do a lot of in-person uh, speeches and talks for corporations, for conferences, for individual groups and clubs and all of that. Uh, and then one by one, that was one of the most depressing things to me <laughs> when we started moving into this lockdown and pandemic uh, was that one by one, things were getting canceled all the way out into the fall. And so I thought, well, I don't want to stop giving my message. And so you look at what tools are available to us now. And so, uh, things like this, uh, webinars, opportunities for people to come in from any place at any time, really, which is kind of an interesting twist on uh, the speaking engagements was pretty appealing to us. So uh, I have a small team after I left T3. I have two staff members now that work with me and we are producing webinars. Uh, we are I've done two already and they've been well received as far as we know and uh, we have another one coming up uh, August 14th I believe we'll check that and put it on the box to make sure the right date but and it's interesting that you mentioned team building because the last one is about building kick-ass teams then we'll do another round of, of uh, talks but we started with three and the title of the three webinars in which they will probably still be the title is eating 
risk for breakfast because that's what I used to always say that I had to do uh, in my life. But this last one is on team building and I, I don't want anyone to be put off that, oh, I don't have a team to build or I'm not managing people. We build teams our entire lives and it may be a team of a freelancer it may be a team of bringing in different people or even in your family uh, or different types of teams because we're always surrounding ourselves with people who I've mentioned earlier can shore up our weaknesses or we have a common goal so it's not just the always a team at the office. It can be teams uh, in a nonprofit you're working on. It can be teams, uh, you know, at a church group you're in or whatever the things that you are passionate about and choosing and building and really motivating people on a team is a, a great mission. Yeah, I think um, one of the things when you were saying, I was, I was thinking, yeah, the t your team is just the people in your life. Um, and if, if you're, if you have like people in your life who are cheering you on, supporting you, who are lending you their resources, their time, there, there, there's so many ways to think of a team. Um, so, so yeah. Well, in my book, I call that kind of team, my rough riders okay. and the rough riders are the ones who will shoot straight with you. Yes. They're, they're colleagues, their friends, their family members, whoever that you can go to, and they will call BS on you. Yeah. Uh, and it takes someone who really loves you and is strong enough to do that because it's easy just to give someone a compliment or to say, oh yeah, that was good. It takes time and care to be able to critique someone in a, a kind way, you know, where you're not being snarky, but you're really saying, you know what, you could have done that in a better way or let's try this uh, or I, I think you kind of stubbed your toe there you better go apologize to that person or whatever you know and so those are the people that you really trust and, and ride with you through the storms and um, I recommend everybody think about who is your who are your rough riders yeah yeah I know I have I have some rough riders in my life I'm really grateful for them people who listen to very early, very rough drafts of my writing yes. again and again and again. Um, so um, I guess um, one thing that I want to talk about before we open it up to anyone um, in the audience who has questions is um, you mentioned that um, at the beginning of this that you use Briggs Myers um, to build your teams. And yeah. I love that. Um, I wanted to hear more about that because you, you talked about it um, being exposed to a diversity of thought um, and how important that is to lead to innovation or, or breakthrough. Um, so I wanted to um, hear more um, about why you do that. Yes, well, it's, it, it's the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs type indicator and the history of it's pretty interesting. It's based on Carl Jung uh, psychology studies and a mother-daughter team actually developed the, the assessment. And so they put this together through studying through the years and it's been around a long time. It's tried and true. And when I ask people to take the assessment uh, or I learn more about who they are because of that, it really helps me to put them again in situations where they are going to shine. Um, but I've used it in so many different ways and it's always helped me to ground myself to go back and re read it what I am. Now you have to understand, I always say that the Myers-Briggs is a zip code. It's not your street address. So it's not gonna, it's not like every detail about you, but it's enough of the broad brush of where your real strengths are and where your pitfalls might be that you can start to work with that. Um, so it's a, it's a very important tool that I've used for many years. And again, I was exposed to it very young in my career, thank goodness, because that was the way that I started to navigate through uh, job searches and, and career opportunities and things that I wanted to accomplish because I would always go back to, well, that's something you're good at. And I, I will say this, we all are faced in times in our lives where we have to go over onto the other side of who we are. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, sometimes you, if you're not a detailed person, you have to do detail work. Sometimes if you aren't that gregarious and outgoing, you're gonna have to put yourself out there and meet people or you'll never, or talk to people or reach out or you won't accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish. But I will say this, if you are in that back, I call it the backup mode, when you're out of your strength zone, yeah. that is when you become really stressed out at some point. You can't do it 
very long. Now we can all do it under, you know, certain situations and we have to, but you want to get back into the place where you're really working on your strengths. And I like what you said about diversity of thought, because as a woman on business, person. I was always really excited about supplier diversity in companies I worked with and meeting some of the people that were diverse in all ways, you know, just so many different forms of diversity. But I do like to add diversity of thinking to that list of diverse individuals because if I've seen too many times where if a company or a team is starting to get bogged down and possibly not as successful as they should be, it's because too many of them are the same. And that goes for all forms of diversity, but especially in diversity of thought. If you're all the same on the Myers-Briggs, for example, or you have very similar personalities, which by the way, is easy to let happen. Yeah. Because I love being around people who are the same type as me. Yeah. We could Everybody. have a blast all day long, but you need those different voices, you know, and the different points of view or you will not innovate. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Well, it, so this is a great time to, to dovetail or to introduce some audience questions because Laura Michelle is asking, um, you know, what, how did you generate business? Because, you know, she's not a, nat what if you're not a natural salesperson or you always struggle with this, um, even though you know it would help if you could speak up? Um, how, how, what's your advice to someone who's in that space? If you can be authentic. Now, this is the thing. Um, it was something that I could do well, but it's not easy. And I'm not saying just because I'm an extrovert and I don't mind mixing it up with people that it's an easy thing because it's hard to walk into a conference into a room of strangers and just start up a conversation. But, you know, you have to kind of push yourself to do that. And a lot of times we can find other people on our team who are really better at that, but they have to be one minded with you if it's your deal, because you're the only person, if it's really something you're passionate about or you're, it's your company or your project you can talk about it in a way that no one else can and so that was something that our clients always really depended on was that they knew they could call me uh, if they hired us and I would be there for them and it was my deal and my name on the line so if it's not something you're comfortable doing there's a lot you can do and that is make sure that you really know people that can influence a situation and that could help you in that and stay in touch with them. There's a lot of ways to stay in touch with people without having to be on the stage or, you know, blaring it out there, but just be authentic to who you are. And if you like writing notes to people, I write tons of handwritten notes that requires no FaceTime whatsoever, but it's a way to connect. Um, and actually my webinar last night was on connections. Um, and I believe so strongly that you carry those with you your entire life. Um, and they come back and, and you never know when someone you met 10 years ago may be the person you want to do business with or the person you want to hang out with tomorrow. So it's, it's something that you can do in your own way, but find ways to connect. Um, and that will usually lead to uh, opportunities or new business. Uh, so um, here's a question that um, is very relevant for the time and what you just um, said was, right now small businesses or independent contractors have to be creative in reaching consumers. Do you have any advice in coming up with ways to, to do that? We have to get good or you have to get good in social media. That's just it. I mean, you know, that and your websites need to be really intuitive uh, and really easy to navigate and you got to direct people there but somehow you know your story has to be told and so you need to start telling the story and be consistent with it uh, one of the problems I always saw in any marketing campaign whether it was from a huge company or a small one is that they would get kind of off brand so to speak, and uh, start saying things and showing things and doing things that would confuse the audience. And no one really has time to understand your business like you do or to care about it. So you need to be very much on brand. Um, everything I do uh, in touch, I try to stay with the colors, with the, I mean, it sounds simple, but with the same typefaces, the same logos, the same color family, the same messaging, the same tone of voice, and all the things we put out there, even the things that we will tweet or put on Instagram and that, that, those opportunities, stay on brand, you know, it's, uh, or here's a fun thing you can do, and it's, it's like, 
spotlighting somebody else and shining a light on them and congratulating them. And that's a great way to connect with people. Um, I also found too that, you know, if someone you know should be nominated for an award uh, or nominated for membership in an organization you're in or that kind of thing, it's a great way to connect and, and honor somebody. And that's a nice thing to do. So there's many things we can do um, that sometimes are just being kind. Yeah. you know just being nice and and people like that and this has kind of been an unhappy not nice time for a lot of people so i think showing some human kindness and uh, genuine caring um could really help build your brand and um make you feel better too yeah someone someone is, has has said you know i'm worn out and exhausted mentally and financially um, by this pandemic how do you pull yourself up how do you pull yourself up in in the in this space I mean, you mentioned that even your, your skyscapes are getting darker um, and it's just the reflective of the, of the time right now. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, you have to be as resourceful as you can. Um, and that's where I, I always go back and say, who do you know? Who can help you? Who is in your network or who knows someone who can? And you've got to just literally force yourself sometimes to pick up the phone or call someone or contact someone that can help you or can give you some ideas. Uh, you know, there were many times uh, during my tenure at T3 where at no fault of our own, we'd be thrown into a recession or, you know, for us, a new chief marketing officer would come into a company and decide to bring his or her team and we would be out and you could lose millions of dollars overnight. And I had that happen to me numerous times um, through my career. Maybe not numerous, but it happened enough that I certainly didn't forget it. Um, so what I did was I literally thought, well, I've got this amazing team and I've got to get out there and sell them because I don't want to have to lay them off. Um, and there were times we did layoffs, but very few. And so I would call everyone I knew, even people I didn't know and say, wow, can I just tell you about the strengths of this team and what they can do and the results that they get. People always want to hear about what results you can get for them. And they like that. So you go charging right into here are the results that we can get and this is what we can do for you. Um, and more times than not, we were able to replace the business uh, by people who finally listened. Uh, but it took a lot of work, you know, I, I honestly, I, I lost one of my biggest clients in 2008 and then we went barely into the recession in 2009 and I've never worked, worked so hard in my whole life uh, trying to replace the business and hang on to people, but we did it and my team came through and I just, I literally just hit the streets, you know, asking people, calling people, showing up um, and trying to sell the business again. Network, so network, network. Yeah, it's all it was. I mean, it was my network came through. So um, someone has a great question. How do you build a team or keep your team motivated in a time when everyone's remote and disconnected? Yeah, this is especially hard, I, I think, because um, mainly for us and for in my career, a lot of the collaboration and just bumping into somebody at lunch or in the coffee, getting coffee or down the hall or walking by someone and peering over their shoulder and saying, oh, what are you working on? That's really cool. Uh, and maybe we could try this or that. And that's the kind of collaborative environment that I built to increase innovation. So we have to work extra hard now. And uh, being seeing each other on a screen and, and doing it this way is at least a way to stay connected. Thank goodness we have this. Yeah, um, or it would be really rough if it was just phone calls and conference calls and that sort of thing with no FaceTime. So um, I do think you have to work extra hard uh, to keep people motivated, but find those things that they're doing well. And this is a time where you have to go out of your way to thank people and reward what they're doing well. Um, you know, they need that pat on the back they need that encouragement and so find what they're doing well and really raise that up and you know when I, what I would do in person actually is when we had staff meetings if someone had done some great work won an award or just done a kind deed or done something interesting for the company I would recognize them and we would all stand up and applaud them you can do that virtually yeah. Uh, and I think that's so important because what it does is it teaches the rest of the team what is appreciated 
and what is rewarded and who gets promoted and who gets a raise and all those things. And so then they will emulate that behavior and that's what you want. You wanna hold up examples of what you think is stellar performance. Yeah. Another question that I wanted to talk about um, uh, that's here is diversity, um, diversity for people of color um, because there's diversity of thought, which I think we all bring. Um, but then there is the, you know, there is the fact that, you know, when you're coming from a different background, um, ethnically or racially, there are all these other things that come along with it. And I wondered how you address that um, when you were at T3 and um, what's your advice um, to businesses now, especially in this moment where everyone's, you know, really like focusing and thinking about that, which is great, um, yeah. racial justice and equal. Absolutely. Yes. Well, you know, first of all, but by being a woman, you know, I felt like I didn't realize it until I was talking to another group of women lately um, that have been CEOs and were kind of a support group for each other uh, that, wow, we did we did some of that breaking through, you know, and now it's our turn to look around us and say, who maybe needs those new opportunities? Who out among us needs to break through and how can we help? And how can we teach through our own experience? Um, because I can tell you many years ago, I am still to this day, a lot of times, I'm the only woman in the room, let alone even a person of color, you know? And so, um, so here's what I did. Uh, several years ago, I literally walked in the office one day and started looking around and I thought, you know what? Too many people in this office look just like me. Um, and we've got to do something about that. And so I didn't wait for, you know, people to force me to do anything or all that, but it's probably came a little bit from my work with supplier diversity in some of these big companies because it really woke me up to saying, we've got to be more diverse on a lot of levels here at, at my company T3. So we set a goal to find people that would bring that diversity, people of color, and we were able to accomplish a lot of those goals. And one of the things that was always frustrating to me, because I would have done this way back, um, but for some reason, um, the advertising industry was not necessarily the uh, industry of choice for a lot of people of color. They would go into other professions. And you know, by being a copywriter and, and you know working in that environment, that even if you sought to find qualified candidates, there weren't as many as you would hope for. So we had to really work at it. But here's what I did to also. Um, you'd find a great person. Uh, I had a wonderful African-American young woman who literally went on the book tour with me and she was my right hand person on everything. And we got to be very close and we had very candid conversations. And I'd say, help me find more people like you. Um, and you know, you have friends, you have colleagues, you have associates and bring them forward you know, introduce us. And so that's how we did that. And, and with our uh, other diverse groups, we would do the same thing, you know, and say, you obviously are, you know, have more maybe in touch with people like you than I do perhaps. And let's, let's bring them in as candidates uh, and let's interview them. And so it really helped to diversify our team, but you've got to be, got your eyes open, you know, and you got to realize what's going on and then seek to set goals and not just make it a, a, well, let's try, but really go out and do it. Well, I just wanna add to piggyback to what you're saying um, because I am a black woman <laughs> and um, working in these spaces, I find that um, a lot of times um, the, the recruiting practices are um, tend to be um, very sort of um, cookie cutter. You're going to the same places, mining the same path, so it feels like there aren't that many um, people of color who are out there who are interested. But I think it's it's about um, you know figuring out new places to go and recruit people, figuring out new methods. And I know for myself when I was in um, you know working um, in in different um, corporate spaces in in the ad world, um, being alone. Um, you know, you would often hear certain things or there were all these little cues in the culture that even though no, everyone was welcoming, but they're little cues that make you feel like if I have to, to 
to pull back on my personality or pull back in some way. And so I, I, my advice to anyone in that space is to actually double down in being yourself because I found that um, ironically, when I became a freelancer, <laughs> I felt so much freer um, because I, I didn't feel the same constraints of having to climb a ladder. And in doing that, I feel like I produced some of my best work um, because I, I felt this freedom to just lean into who I am. So anyway. No, that's really great advice. And uh, I'm really glad you spoke up about that. You know, again, dialing back to my own experience, uh, my first job out of college, I was the second woman that had ever been hired in that company in the wow. creative department, mm -hmm. second in the history of the company. And it was a boys club yeah. supreme. <laughs> and honestly, I only made it in that job for nine months. And I think that's because was the reason it was very intimidating to me um and i won't go into why but it really was and i'm not easily intimidated but that one got me and so i can certainly appreciate uh when you're one of few <laughs> or you know kind of the lone person uh in an organization that it's hard um and it's, it's really kind of difficult to uh not feel like you're somewhat pushed aside and, and so it's really an interesting dynamic but we all have to work so much harder at this and uh make people feel a part of the teams uh, go we have to kind of go out of our way is mm -hmm. what i'm saying right now it's not something we can just continue to say well that's just the way it is you know we have to be diligent yeah it sounds like you're i mean that's what the cowgirls did they you know they pushed through it wasn't it wasn't that they were welcomed but um in spite of they 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 forced their way in. Uh, so. Yeah, and many times against their parents' wishes as well. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them, their parents had great aspirations for them, and they sent them off to boarding school and everything, and, they, and several of them escaped and just joined the Wild West show. So you can imagine how the families felt about that. But yeah. they, were, they did their own thing. You know, they went, if they were passionate about something, they just followed their dream. Great. Well, we have, I think we have time for a couple more questions. And one that came in um, is why did you start your own company? Well, that's right. I'll try to make this story as brief <laughs> as possible. But th this was started, T3 was started in 1989. And for anyone who's old enough to remember, or if you know history, that was a very, very deep recession time. Uh, Texas was particularly hurt and I was working in Austin, Texas. So I wrote a business plan uh, in this company I was working for and I made a fatal mistake and that is I tried to bring people along you know, on what we were going to do to turn the company around, but I forgot one person and that was the president. And so he read my business plan and said, I don't agree with you and I'm not going to support this plan. So I got mad and humiliated. And about 15 minutes after that, I walked down the hall and quit and I didn't even know what I was going to do. Uh, but I had to figure it out pretty quick. So I cashed in a $16,000 IRA and went off and incorporated and had to start a business because no one would have hired me. No one had any jobs. And so I just said, well, I guess this is my time. I'm gonna have to do it myself. And I did believe in my business strategy and my business plan. And so I put it in practice and that's why it happened. It wasn't that one day I was very happy in my job and I was sitting there thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to start my own agency? Because that's not the way it happened. It was almost out of necessity. I, I boxed myself in a corner and couldn't get out. So <laughs> I had to I had to do that to survive. Yeah, necessity is the mother of reinvention, it sounds like, yeah. Um, and my one last question is what's next? What are you working on now? And if you have any sort of closing thoughts on this conversation? Yes, I'm, there's maybe another book in the works. Uh, I'm making sure that it, uh, I have enough relevant content. Um, and so that's kind of on the back burner, but I really am focusing on teaching leadership traits and uh, leadership know-how. So whatever way and opportunities I can do that, we are working with several large companies for me to do some spe uh, special webinars for them, just for their teams, uh, you know, very tailored to their needs. Uh, and then we'll continue to do the live webinars to open to everybody. Um, and beyond that, uh, I would like to put in a, a much more, and we're working on this too, uh, a much more focused leadership program that would last over several months for some individuals. So uh, I love seeing people step into these leadership roles. And what is interesting to me uh, on the boards I'm on, and I continue to serve on boards, and that's a 
fun thing to do if you're passionate about those companies or organizations and nonprofits. But I'm seeing people who are all of a sudden, who weren't maybe placed in a leadership role and they're not managing people, but all of a sudden now during this crisis, they've stepped up and really shown the true leadership ability that we are all seeking in our organizations and companies. And those are the folks that I get so excited about because um, I'd love to bring them in and say, okay, if I could just put some jet fuel, you know, underneath you and you'll jump ahead much faster. I had to learn all this stuff the hard way, you know? yeah. <laughs> going through my business and doing it. So if I can fast track somebody into a stronger leadership position, we need leaders. I really need leaders on every level and I love people who want to aspire to leadership so I'd like to be there for them. Well thank you this I think we could keep going I'm looking at the time um, we could oh, keep no. going I've learned so much and I could learn so much more from you you're an amazing woman very inspiring um, and I am you know, from the questions that came in, a lot of people um, are also really inspired by you and learned a lot from you today. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for taking your time to share some of your wisdom with us and um, looking forward to, you know, following you um, in, into the next um, phase of your, um, you know, your, your journey, your life, your career. Um, and your your art is beautiful. I, I kept uh, my eyes kept wandering behind you. Your art is really beautiful. So thank you. And it's so nice meeting you as well. And so for everyone who's listening still on, uh, now I have a new connection. So yeah. and I will be following up and we have things in common and backgrounds. And so I would love to stay connected with you and help you any way that I can. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us. And um, f keep following us. Um, you can follow, I believe, um, all of our social handles are in the chat, but it's um, Instagram at Gay Gaddis, um, at Blonde and Co NYC, and at Shop Exit 14. Uh, so looking forward to staying in contact with everyone. Thank you again. Thanks bye -bye. so much. Appreciate it.